here. Just doesn't speak normally. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Yeah. Yep. You got it. Okay.
Hi, can I have everybody's attention, please? Good evening. Welcome to Community Medical School, our spring session of 2019. My name is Michelle Brooklis, and I'm the PR and Events Manager for the Larner College of Medicine. Before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping um, kind of things to go over. At every few seats, you're going to see a stack of colorful cards that have letters A through F on them. Those are going to be a part of an activity that's going to happen during Dr. Flyer's presentation, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about that when he gets up. If you don't have those colorful cards next to you, try and make friends with the people next to you who do, and it'll be a little bit of a kind of team effort here. In the last page of your packet, it should be a purple sheet. You'll see there's an evaluation form. I ask that you fill that out and hand it in to one of my colleagues on your way out. Um, we really do value your feedback, and we've used it um, over the years to continue to hone this program um, and make it better. Um, Dr. Warshaw and Dr. Flyer are going to speak for an hour. There's going to be a 30-minute Q&A session at the end. I ask that you hold your questions until that 30-minute Q&A. Um, when we do the Q&A session, um, I will be handing out microphones. And just hold on to your question until you have a microphone in your hand. We want to make sure that all of the other attendees can hear the question that you're asking. And we do ask that each person limit their question to one question per person. If you have additional questions and you want to come down and speak to our presenters afterwards, you're welcome to do that. Uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Schneider. Dr. Schneider is a professor of medicine at the Larner College of Medicine and director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute of Vermont, otherwise known as CVRI. And the lecture tonight was made possible by the Larner College of Medicine, the UVM Medical Center, and CVRI. So please uh, welcome Dave Schneider with me. So I'm kind of the warm-up act. Uh, welcome. Um, it's, it's great to see all of you guys here. Um, I thought I'd just start because um, for some in the audience, I think you wonder, what is the Cardiovascular Research Institute? And uh, I'll start by just telling you a moment about that. It's a multidisciplinary institute for the entire university that seeks to foster cardiovascular research. So cardiovascular research is specifically designed to improve the health people like you, in the area of cardiovascular disease. So heart attack, stroke, heart failure, heart rhythm disorders, um, and also prevention of disorders, those disorders as they, as they come along. One of the key focuses of our group is to highlight um, excellence in cardiovascular research. We're really happy that you're here. Um, in Vermont, there's this uh, concept of I think a lot of people are, uh, keep the light underneath a bushel basket, and so one of our goals at the CVRI is to pull the top off that and show you guys one of some of the exciting work that's going on here. Um, and our goal is really to highlight outstanding researchers. We actually have a few of them here tonight. Our dean is here tonight. Our dean joined us um, six, no, four months ago, five months ago, somewhere in that ballpark um, in October. Um, and I'm impressed to say that he is in the top 1% of individuals in cardiovascular research whose work is cited. What does that really mean? It means that people pay attention to what he does. His research has been impactful and changed how we care for patients. And that's pretty exciting from my perspective to have a dean who very, very focused, who's, who's very interested in cardiovascular. His area of interest is heart rhythm or electrophysiology. Another senior scientist here you're going to be hearing from is uh, Dr. Warshaw, who's uh, chair of physiology and molecular biophysics. And he does really exciting research at the bench trying to understand what, how the heart as a motor works, understanding the molecular mechanisms that underpin that. And he's doing really exciting work in understanding how gen differences in your genetic profile can impact on that heart and actually defining really novel approaches to the care of those patients. And I'm sure you're going to be excited to hear what he has to say. The other side of the CVRI is to foster the development of early career investigators. And we have one of those here, too. And that's one of our other speakers, Dr. Flyer, who's kind of the other end of the spectrum. So he's in the trenches. He's seen patients on a regular basis. 
and he's trying to translate that research into literally providing better care for his patients. So this talk is a bit of a microcosm of what we do, is pulling together early career folks, senior folks, it, it includes clinical research, it includes basic science research, um, and I hope that uh, it'll be enjoyable to you. And I'll turn it over to Jonathan. Thank you, Dr. Schneider, Dean Page, the community of Vermont and Burlington. Thanks for coming tonight. There's a lot of things you could do with your Tuesday evening, and here you are joining us. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Warshaw for all his research and mentorship with this presentation. Our talk tonight is Bigger Isn't Better. That's the title with subtitles, Risks and Reasons for an Enlarged Heart. We're going to talk about primarily hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is Dr. Warshaw's area of research expertise. We have no disclosures between his lab and my clinical skills. However, uh, I have a few family secrets. I can't share those. I don't know Dr. Warshaw's family secrets. And probably the biggest disclosure is I'm a pediatric cardiologist. So I take care of children and young adults with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Oftentimes in the Larner College of Medicine, I put this small cartoon up there. We see medical students early in the morning and they got to get going. I thought, everybody, this is an evening presentation. Whatever bamboo or other things you need to get charged up, we're going to have a nice time. A couple objectives uh, for the first half of tonight's talk. Um, first of all, I wanted to introduce an experience to the room. That's the University of Vermont active learning process. And we'll go through those uh, exercises. There's some cards on the desk for you to work with, and that will become clear at the time. I'll also be defining what is a cardiomyopathy and talking a bit about that. And everybody in the room is going to help me evaluate some patients and families. And at the end, we'll have a nice discussion. <clears throat> For those that were looking at the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see I also put up a very brief uh, ski map. So beginner, intermediate, expert terrain. You'll see these symbols pop up throughout the talk. You'll know if you're getting in over your head or not. Just stay on the easy trails. I'll be with you the whole time. One of my tasks tonight is to introduce a concept of active learning. This is the way that students are taught now at the medical school. The curriculum is 100% active learning. I'm a lecturer, a presenter in the medical school. So what does that mean? Over the next three or four minutes, I'm going to help introduce that concept and we'll practice it together. Active learning can be contrasted with passive learning. If something's active, the opposite is passive. So active learning is very student-based. Students engage and construct knowledge. They demonstrate and teach knowledge to each other. They apply and discuss this knowledge in small groups. That teaches very effective teamwork and communication. The difference there is probably what most folks in the room and certainly how I was taught was a lecture-based format where students come to class in this type of amphitheater. There's a lecturer. The lecturer provides facts. The students absorb those facts. The faculty are considered experts. They transfer information directly. The faculty talk at the students, and they come back and take a test. Perhaps I can show you the difference in pictures. Oh, before we get there, I want to let you know active learning is very popular, and the University of Vermont has been all over the news, national press, NPR, the New England Journal of Medicine, Boston Globe for this innovative curriculum. But what does it look like in pictures? On the right-hand side, a few folks know this. This is one of my favorite movies. On the right-hand side, we have Dr. Jones, very prominent archaeologist. He certainly must know everything in the field of archaeology. He'll bring students in, and he'll lecture them. If you know what comes next, there's a young woman in the front who blinks her eyelids and communicates with Dr. Jones that way. There's no speaking between students uh, and the lecturer. But active learning is a much different format. You'll see two pictures here. The bottom right-hand picture is students around a table. They're having discussions with each other about the knowledge and the subject at hand. And then the top left picture, there's a faculty moderator. I'm one of those. And we'll help lead the discussions. The students have read before class. They come in prepared with the material. And then we'll do active learning exercises together. 
the basic tenet is students need to read and prepare before class. Class is where team-based learning occurs. There's a group pre-test, so students will sit at a table and they'll answer questions in a group, and then there's a post-test. And that's supposed to promote discussion of foundational concepts, knowledge, and the application of those principles. Is everyone ready? We're about to actively learn. Okay. Here you go. This is your pre-reading. In this circle is less than 100 words. This is brought to you directly from the Vermont Secretary of State Office of Professional Regulation. I know everyone reads this website quite often. Let's suppose you wanted to become a notary public in the state of Vermont. These are the requirements. I'm going to ask you to spend one minute reading the screen. This is your homework before class. And then I will give you a short pre-test. Are you ready? Okay, then your, your time begins now. your hand if you'd like more time. <laughs> Everyone wants more time. Dr. Robinson, did you read the screen? You're, I'm going to give you a test now. Did you read the screen? Okay, we'll wait for Dr. Robinson. He's late to class. Mm -hmm. The heart is in between the lines. Okay, here we go. So there are some cards on the desks in front of you. Um, there are going to be some letters. And this is your pretest. Okay, here we go. This is a direct question. This is some beginner terrain. This is an example of what a medical student would have to answer, not about a notary public, but about medical knowledge. So my question to you is to be a notary public in the state of Vermont, which of the following is not a requirement? Wow, I'm incredibly impressed. Do you know it costs $15, though? Everybody knew that. Okay, so very easily I'll look around the room and we'll be able to see that students have mastered this concept and we can move on. There'll be a series of questions and as we detect some controversy in the knowledge base, we'll be able to spend more time on those concepts. Clearly we don't need to spend any more time on notary publics. Other examples will demonstrate or offer students a chance to look at medical imaging. So an example would be we show them an EKG the question would be, it's obtained today for a 17-year-old female with palpitations during English literature class. I picked that because I was an English literature major, and I put this tracing because Dean Page is an electrophysiologist, and I, I had to pay homage to that. I'm not going to ask you to answer this question, but students will have to start to incorporate more advanced questions as the semester goes on, and ultimately what we do is some say present, but I like to say blindside, with the longer case, also known as the art of distraction, where they'll have to read long passages about patients um, and begin to generate a differential diagnosis um, and demonstrate even more complex thinking. Students will have to answer questions such as these on several board examinations. Now that everybody knows how to active, actively learn, we're going to move into the heart of the matter and continue to actively learn throughout the first half hour. So very simply, <coughs> heart, it's a muscle. On the left-hand side, this is Shalane Flanagan. She won the New York City Marathon. I was there. It was incredible. I was not participating. And on the right-hand side is one of my favorite TV shows of all time. This is the World's Strongest Man competition where humans actually pull things like fire trucks, buses. And while I was preparing for this talk, I saw a few with airplanes. I don't understand how that's possible. The heart is a muscle. It's right there in the center of the chest. As Dr. Robinson, a pulmonologist, just taught us, the lungs are around the heart. Then come ribs, muscle, nerves. It's our most vital organ. What is the purpose of the heart? The heart is here to pump and pump and pump over again endlessly. It's why I became a cardiologist. It's fascinating to me. I love listening to the heart. It never stops. The purpose is to move blood, 
lose blood to the lungs, lose blood to the body. And I wanted to share with everybody, I thought there's three basic parts of the heart. Parts of the heart that collect blood, parts of the heart that direct blood, and then parts of the heart that eject blood. If you look on the right-hand side of the screen, the atria collect blood. I think I have a pointer here. The top parts of the heart collect. The middle parts, which are valves, inflow valves and outflow valves, direct the blood. And the bottom parts are called ventricles. They're the big pumps, and they eject the blood. So what's a cardiomyopathy? <laughs> this is it. This is a cardiomyopathy. I wanted to break it down. We often use really large words in medicine. I'm a pediatric cardiologist, so my job is to sit and translate these large words, not only to help children understand, but parents, families, grandparents, younger siblings, everyone. So some medical vocabulary. A cardiomyopathy can be easily broken down into three words, cardio, myo, and pathos. I think we know these. I'll give you some pictures. You've seen this one, you've seen that one, and this is the best I could come up to describe pathos. Okay, Say, just yell it out if you know what cardio means. Excellent, and? Perfect, and? I like it, disease, disorder, suffering, that is all correct. So very simply, the heart muscle is suffering and there's a heart muscle disorder. But what's a cardiomyopathy? Well, cardiomyopathies can actually come in two general flavors. The heart can get big for two reasons. It can either hypertrophy or it can dilate. And I want to spend a moment discussing the differences here. This is thanks to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Not defined in 1828, but since 1828. Hypertrophy, very simply, means excessive organ development. So you have a heart, it's going to increase in bulk. The parts of the heart will multiply, but the muscle fibers will become thickening. And when that happens, that's called cardiac hypertrophy. The second definition would be exaggerated growth, again, of the muscle fibers themselves. Dilation, however, is a different concept. That's when you stretch or enlarge an organ or part of the body. Some examples of when the heart can get bigger, utilizing these concepts of hypertrophy and dilation, I'd like to share those with you. The first is something I think in the room that most people are familiar with, and that is hypertension. It's a fancy word for elevated blood pressure. Hypertension typically causes hypertrophy. The vascular resistance of our, syste our system, the systemic vasculature is raised. The pump behind it, which is the left ventricle, has to pump out. This is the left ventricle. It has to pump out this red tube called the aorta to the body. The muscle is going to become thickened over time. It needs to do more work pumping and pumping. I don't deal too much in pediatrics with hypertension and left ventricular hypertrophy, but I do deal a lot with obstruction, which is another reason why the heart may become enlarged. And if you have an obstruction within the heart, the muscle can hypertrophy. An example here would be there's a valve, an outflow valve on the right-hand side of the heart. There's that valve. This, red, this yellow arrow is going to show blood flow out of the heart. If blood can't exit the heart, that valve becomes blocked or obstructed. The muscle behind or the pump is going to thicken up and try to generate more and more and more pressure. It's going to become thicker to do that. It is in the gym lifting weights to try to eject blood past a blocked opening. In contrast to that, hearts can dilate. If there's a communication within the heart that is not normal, this is more of what I see in pediatric cardiology. The top parts of the heart collect blood, we said. Those are called atria. But if this wall between the two, pot, two top parts of the heart is not completely formed, then there's going to be an opening, and blood can easily pass from the left side in the direction of this yellow arrow over to the right side. And as blood moves from one side of the top of the heart to the other and down to the bottom, the heart can actually dilate. It'll fill like a balloon that's getting filled with water in the summertime. It'll dilate, but it won't hypertrophy. But back to cardiomyopathies, which one, why? Cardiomyopathies can cause hypertrophy or they can cause dilation. This is a cartoon that explains everything I just said to you. 
this is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a dilated cardiomyopathy, and we can't introduce new concepts, but there's even other more rare types of cardiomyopathies. <coughs> this is an example of what a normal cardiac pathologic specimen would look like. On the top part is a cartoon that shows the right side of the heart, atrium and ventricle, that collects blood and ejects blood, and then the red side is the left ventricle and left atrium, and that corresponds with this heart chamber here. This is the left ventricle, and this is the normal size of that muscular wall. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can see in this cartoon, the septum or wall between the two ventricles is actually greatly enlarged. It's thick, and you can see that right here. This part is much larger than this part. This part corresponds with this cartoon up here. And it's thick all the way around, but particularly in between the two bottom pumping chambers. A dilated cardiomyopathy will look much different. The left ventricle is enlarged, but the wall itself is thin, not thick. And you can see that over here. This pathologic specimen looks much different. It's happening, active learning. This is an intermediate question. We've talked a lot about cardiomyopathies now. So I'm going to ask you, a five-year-old child has a genetic defect that causes the heart muscle to thicken. This defect might cause ventricular A, hypertrophy. Oh, you guys are good. You're too quick. B, dilation, or C, Shakespearean comedy. C, we have one C, two Cs. Excellent. The A's have it. The heart muscle is progressively thickened. That's the concept of hypertrophy. For example, if we were in class, and we're in class now, if everyone held up B, then we'd go back into the lecture and dive back into these concepts. But you guys are too good. I'd like to touch on some genetics, because I said that child had a genetic defect that caused a heart problem. Genes, in humans, there's about 30 to 40,000 genes. genes in summary, code proteins. And what do proteins do? They make muscle. Humans have 23 pairs, typically, of chromosomes. And the Human Genome Project, which many of you have probably read about in the last decade or two, it was completed in 2003, identified over 1,800 disease genes and helped create over 2,000 genetic tests for human conditions. <laughs> Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy about 34% of patients we find with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have a genetic cause. So that means in one third of patients, we can identify a gene that's caused the problem. It's typically inherited in the family in an autosomal dominant condition, or <clears throat> 11 genes have been identified in over 1,500 different mutations. I just wanted to clarify what is autosomal dominant, and that's best shown in this picture. This is a couple, and they've had four children. This red square is in the center of this gentleman's chest, and it's on his two chromosomes here. The father is affected. Let's say he has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Each parent has to pass one chromosome, and on the chromosome are many genes. If the father passes one chromosome that's affected, and the mother passes a chromosome that is not affected, she actually has two that are not affected, because one chromosome is affected and it's dominant, it dominates the pattern of inheritance, and the son will be affected. He will have the disease. For the two children in the middle, the father has actually passed the unaffected, this purple chromosome, to the daughter, and the mother has done the same, and the same for the son. But the father here passes his affected chromosome, the red one, to his daughter, and she will also have the disease. If you pass it, then you get it. That's the summary. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in terms of inheritable pattern is one of the most common in the world. Historically, it's in about one in 500 people. It's a problem with muscle and contractile proteins as we've discussed. On the map to the right, over 122 countries have been identified as having patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. How is this diagnosed? We'll get into that in a little, a little bit, but w this is a definition of unexplained left ventricular hypertrophy. 
if the septum is over 15 millimeters, which is 1.5 centimeters, and we can measure that by a number of different ways, then that's considered to be a problem. Or if it's a little less, 13 millimeters, but there's a direct first degree relative with the condition, that's considered a concern and probably diagnostic. But what's the problem? The heart muscle is getting thicker. I go to the gym, I work out, that's a good thing. So my heart's working out, it's getting thicker. Why is this a problem? Can, can a thicker muscle actually slow you down? Let's go back to our key concepts of what the heart does. It collects blood, it directs blood, and it ejects blood. The main problem is that this heart muscle in between the two ventricles and around the left ventricle has actually grown thicker over time. If it grows thicker as the heart squeezes and then tries to relax, there's going to be a problem. It's going to have impaired relaxation because that thick muscle is not going to be able to gently relax and fill with blood as easily as it could if it were a normal size. Over time, it may actually have problems as it begins to squeeze as well. You can see in this picture that as it gets thicker, it's actually going to block blood flow out past this valve, analogous to that picture of obstruction that I showed you a few slides ago. And that can block blood out to the body as well as blood flow back to the heart itself. And again, as this muscle thickens over time, it actually is disorganized and can cause scarring within the heart. And that can cause arrhythmias, which is a fancy word for abnormal or irregular heart rhythms. If you work backwards, this obstruction here can actually cause problems with the preceding valve. It can begin to leak. And then if you think even farther upstream and backwards, as this thickens and the heart muscle can't relax and the valve begins to leak, then the chamber upstream, the atria, is beginning, <clears throat> the pressure is going to raise and that may back up into the lungs. So the whole system is going to be affected. This can manifest in any number of ways. General complaints of being tired, feeling dizzy or fainting can happen. Irregular heartbeats and rhythms, shortness of breath, chest pain. And you can have swelling pretty much anywhere in the body, hands, feet, abdomen. Most patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, cardiomyopathy however, have a generally favorable prognosis or outcome. Most of these patients are either undiagnosed or asymptomatic. Less than 50% actually have heart failure. And heart failure, the simple definition is the heart's inability to meet the body's needs. And heart failure can range from very mild symptoms to very, very severe. But the big concern is if I don't have heart failure, or I do, and also, well, what are the chances that I could die from this, and can I die suddenly? And I mentioned before on the preceding slide that the disorganization of the muscle fibers can actually cause arrhythmias. And the number one arrhythmia is ventricular fibrillation. That's a disorganized rhythm from the bottom of the heart that doesn't allow effective, the pump to effectively circulate blood. On this side of the screen, I put up a patient map because most folks think that this is very clear cut. It's very easy to find these patients. They just come in, they say, I have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy right there, and then we move forward in a very organized way. <clears throat> the truth is, is that patients come to us in many different manners, and I put up this road map because it's quite complex. I've had patients come in all of these formats. <clears throat> some patients are screened in athletic activities. Some patients had some other illness, and then they were found to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Other patients manifest with symptoms or cardiac dysfunction. They have arrhythmias, or we don't find this out until after they die. And this is actually one of my favorites, and I've had a few patients come this way. They came in for one thing, they feel fine, we did some testing, and we found something else. Anyone hungry? <laughs> Tired? In the next couple of slides, I'd like everybody to focus on the left side of the screen and the right. I'd like to train your eyes to pick up some subtle abnormalities, but I believe we can do this together. The picture on the left and the picture on the right are actually different. There's seven differences. I know that you already found all seven. There's one. Yeah. Okay, they're going to light up. You found them all? They're all over there. I love sushi. 
There's always one that you can't find, though. I had to stare at the screen for a while. There's one more. Do you know that they put up here one extra line in the salmon roll? <laughs> like, so tricky. But now when I order sushi, I'm always counting the lines in the salmon roll. <laughs> An EKG is one type of cardiac test that we have. It's been around for over 100 years. I put a picture of a light bulb in a heart. It's the electrical conductivity of the heart muscle. It's the roadmap for electricity, how the heart pumps, and it directs the organization, the rhythmic beating. It's that thing you see on TV shows or when you're at the doctor's visit and they say, here's your EKG, and it's this long strip of squiggly lines, lumps, bumps, and so forth. This is actually corresponding to the lobe and the dub of the heart, the heart valves. The top parts of the heart are the atria and the bottom are the ventricles and they each begin to squeeze. We hear the lub and the dub and we see that on the paper. Okay, electricity, paper. Now we can do an exercise together. Think about sushi, left of the screen, right of the screen. I'm gonna show you two EKGs. The one labeled normal is normal. The med students always think I'm trying to trick them and sometimes I am, but I'll tell you that it's normal tonight. And the one that's labeled HCM, which is short for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, is different from the normal one. So there's two differences here. Take your time. Okay, the first, in no particular order, is that this line looks much shorter than this line. These lines actually correlate roughly to the mass or the size or the thickness of the pumping chambers. So we talked about how in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that muscle would begin to thicken up. And you can see the difference in the size there. But the other may be a little more subtle. And you'll see one part of the heart. This is as the heart starts to relax again and refill. You'll see that one goes up and the other goes down. As the heart muscle tries to relax, it can't relax normally. The muscle is disorganized. It's not working properly. So one of the ways we can tell that there could be a problem is to do an EKG and look for these signs for patients. These are just two examples. Okay, you pass the EKG, so we'll take it one step farther. Ultrasound, this is very common. This day and age, it looks exactly like a loaf of bread. You're wondering why is there a loaf of bread? I'll teach you echo in under five seconds. Are you ready? Echo, which is a fancy word for heart, uh, an ultrasound for a heart, is like looking at a loaf of bread. There's many slices. You get that loaf, you cannot wait to make a sandwich. One slice, the other slice, the other slice, the other slice. We look at the heart the same way using sound waves. This is my area of expertise. This is a baby. Each line will look with ultrasound and it'll give us a different slice of the anatomy or the organs that we're looking at with the sound wave. And then we stack them all back together like a loaf of bread. Perfect, easy, right? You're all hired. Let's take a look at two different pictures. Here we're gonna slice the heart like a loaf of bread. If you took this ultrasound probe and you looked at the heart in one plane or view, you'd take out four chambers. You've been looking at these already. These collect, these are the valves that direct, and here are the ventricles that eject. If you take your flashlight or your sound wave and you shine it on the heart, it's actually gonna look like this on the screen. This is the right side of the heart and the left these are the atria that collect, the valves that eject, and the ventricles, sorry, the valves that direct and the ventricles eject. This yellow line is the size of a normal wall between the heart muscles. This is a picture of an echocardiogram of a patient who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It should play through a few times. This is the right side of the heart. That's this side. And this is the left side. And it has stalled. Very well, you get the picture. This is the wall between the two ventricles. This is the left ventricle. This is clearly hypertrophied, much, much thicker than this side. Can everybody appreciate that? Okay, we'll look at it in a different way now. Same thing, 
take this, the flashlight or the sound waves, look at the heart. This is the left ventricle now looking at it in a different way and the right ventricle. This is what it would look like on the screen, right side of the heart and left. Here's the wall, we've turned it sideways. This is a normal thickness. This is the same patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Before I press play, I'll just comment. This is the ventricular septum. You'll see it's much thicker than this side. Perfect. Okay. For the cardiologists in the room, I tried to choose examples that were, as we call, not subtle. Hopefully everybody can see how thick this side, this wall is. Pathologic specimens will actually show these changes are quite severe. On the left-hand side, that was the first echo picture I showed you. Here is the left ventricle. This is the outside wall. This is the wall between the two pumping chambers. And this yellow part is how thick that septum is. You can see the ruler on the bottom. If you turn the heart sideways, as we did in the second echo picture, you're going to see how thick the wall is between. And pay attention not only to the wall that's thick, but the space that's left. This is in between the two walls. It's nearly gone. So you can imagine how hard it is to fill and relax when that space has decreased greatly in size. You guys aren't done with me yet. More active learning. Okay, I'll lead you through this one. This is expert terrain, beware. A 21-year-old collapses suddenly while running. His EKG, you know what that is, and his echo, we learned that, show left ventricular hypertrophy, uh-oh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy perhaps. An uncle and cousin died suddenly. That's very worrisome. Genetic studies are pending. Which cardiac MRI, and an MRI is a fancy way of looking at the heart using magnets, best illustrates hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Before you answer, I'll tell you that this is actually flipped upside down based on the other pictures we're looking at. But this yellow line is a normal size ventricular septum. Don't say yes, OK. Everyone's very eager to answer. OK, that's A. Use all the clues you have. Every last one of them. A lot of Bs. Very good. One C. OK, that's great. <laughs> Look how much thicker this wall is than the one above it. Very good. I'm impressed. So I wanted to share with you this, is a, this topic comes up every few years in the state of Vermont and in every state and in every county because a young, otherwise healthy athlete will be playing a sport and will drop suddenly. And this is one of these diagnoses that can be found if a young, healthy person suddenly dies. This is tragic for the community. It remains tragic for decades to come. It's tragic for families and friends and everyone. I was very impressed that over the last few months, um, this actually came out in 2018, the New England Journal of Medicine, which for the physicians in the room, you know, is the finest bedtime reading that we can find. <laughs> but this study combined like all of my interests. I love soccer. I've never been to England, but I'm very interested in sudden cardiac death and cardiology. Uh, this is unbelievable. What they do is they took over 20 years, late 90s to mid 2000s, uh, they took all players who were English soccer players who were enrolled in elite soccer academies. They want to be professional soccer players. They're age 15 to 17. These are healthy youngsters. And they screened all of them. They're trying to find the children who they wouldn't know otherwise had a problem. So they screened over 11,000 young adolescents. And they're looking for any cause of sudden cardiac death so that somebody doesn't go out into the football pitch and then drop suddenly and they say, how come you didn't know? They screen 11,000. Screening was a visit with a physician. You fill out a complex questionnaire. You get an EKG and an echocardiogram. And that is looked at by a pediatric cardiologist. That is unbelievable. They screen 11,000. 7%, so a small percentage, show up as, quote, abnormal. Of the abnormal ones that they find, 95% of them on further testing are actually normal. It's fa false positive. 
we thought it was something, we looked into it more, it's not. How many times do you go to the doctor they tell you that? Don't worry about it. So they find a small number of people they're worried about, but the majority of those actually don't have a problem. But the point I'm trying to make is that this is really hard to do. But they actually found 42 patients, okay, in that 830 that had a cause that could be responsible for a sudden cardiac death. Could be, not necessarily will be, might be, maybe, we're worried about you. But of 42 patients, only five of those were hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And they actually kept track of all of them and only two had sudden cardiac death. But what about all the other patients? Everybody who is said to be normal, well, one and a half percent of the normal actually did die suddenly from things that weren't anticipated. Cancers, traffic accidents, drug overdoses, suicides. Common things still happen. But what about the unexpected? Well, a very, very small number had sudden cardiac death unforeseen, and only one of those was found to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. My point is this is a outstanding look over 20 years of exceptionally fit people with excellent national healthcare system looking for problems. It's a really hard thing to identify, and even when you identify it, bad things can still happen. I'd like to finish my time here by talking about family and patient-centered care. This is exactly what it looks like, patient-centered care. This is our children's hospital. Physicians are always typing on computers. They don't face the child. This child's five years old. No, it looks like this. Come on. There it is. Opportunity for branding. You're welcome, Lewis, first. Everyone is facing the patient. What I'd like to share is that this is a team-based approach. Everyone is involved. In the center of these very difficult discussions, the community and the family, the child, and you have a team around you of clinicians and researchers, people that are trying to help answer these questions, nursing staff, social work, nutritionists, all types of medical staff, all types of therapists, everyone available. This is a complex scenario, and we try to give all support. <clears throat> Just to finish a little bit with what might happen if you're diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, well, if you have left ventricular hypertrophy and we've determined that that's the cause, there's really three main focuses that our medical team tries to center on. One is screening your family. Can we pick out other people who could have a problem? Two is identifying people who actually have heart failure symptoms and providing therapy to them. And then the third is trying to identify people who might have problems unforetold, sudden cardiac death and risks for that. This involves a lot of shared discussion, all to calculate what is your risk. So for family screening, you've seen these pictures, we'll do EKGs and echoes, and if genetic testing is possible, we'll offer that and try to see if there's some answers there. For folks who actually have heart failure and symptoms of that, oftentimes your doctors will talk to you about modifying your lifestyle. You probably all have heard that, but the subtitle there is really trying to figure out when exercise is helpful and when it's harmful, and this is a very difficult thing to do love to ride my bike and we try to have patients exercise as much as possible but everyone's a little different. Some medications are available to help ease the stress of the heart and every now and then if the obstruction is great enough there's two possibilities. One is surgery which is the gold standard. The other is a more complex procedure potentially called an ablation that's done by cardiologists, surgery by surgeons. That is all to try to decrease the size of the heart muscle and relieve that obstruction. And last but not least the sudden risk of cardiac death from arrhythmias. Folks might have an implantable cardial defibrillator placed, and the reason for that, that's a fancy computer to detect a heart rhythm problem and try to shock you out of it back to a normal pumping rhythm. I'd like to end with some patients and stories. These are all patients of mine, but you wouldn't know. I'm a pediatric cardiologist, so you have to find which one's my patient. Mm -hmm. A 66-year-old woman has her first heart attack she gets to the hospital, and then her doctors find another condition. So the 66-year-old is not my patient, but she has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
and she wants to know after she gets discharged from the hospital, but what about my daughter and what about my granddaughter? I learned about her because I met her granddaughter and I have to answer all these questions. We go on this journey together. This is one of my favorite patients of all time. I asked his permission or her to use this picture. When he or she showed me this picture, I said, what are you doing? He or she said, I am climbing on a bridge above the Winooski River, and I am lighting up colored smoke. Don't you do that in your free time? I responded, uh, not as much probably as you. 16. He or she wants to talk about backcountry skiing and living this crazy, adventurous life. I have to talk to this patient about Safety, not only as an adolescent, but safety about your heart. He wants to know what about my life, my sister, my parents, my grandparents. I've had this diagnosis now. What do I do? I want to live this great adventure. Lastly, a 36-year-old woman is pregnant. She talks to you about her happy three-year-old son, but tattoos cover a scar on her chest. She has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. She's had surgery. That's the scar. She's seeing me because she wants to know what about her unborn child and what about her three-year-old son? How will my pregnancy turn out? What about my child? Will he have the problem? How does this all come together? Luckily, Dr. Warshaw is going to explain it to us in one minute. He's going to answer a lot of questions and teach us about innovative therapies down the road that are coming. I wanted to thank everybody for their attention, for their willingness to go on this active learning journey with me and learn about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I encourage you, I'd like to thank the University of Vermont College of Medicine and Community Medical School for inviting me. And as we move after Dr. Washaw speaks to the question and answer portion, I'd just like to remind you that I'll cover your meal if you pick <laughs> the other guy when asking tough questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Flyer, and thank you all for being here. Um, I guess I have a tall order. Um, Jonathan says I'm going to tell you why this all happens and that I have all the answers. And I'm going to start off by saying I don't. Okay? So, um, so the interesting thing is uh, we have a very unique opportunity here. Here at the uh, University of Vermont, the Larner College of Medicine, uh, and the University of Vermont Medical Center. Uh, we as basic scientists rub shoulders with clinicians. I rub shoulders with Jonathan. And, and that creates a situation where there's this information transfer between the two sides of the house that you can't get everywhere in this world. And so I just want to say first and foremost to you as Vermonters and myself, we're all lucky. Okay? So I'm going to take you on a little journey. Should be fairly quick. But it's going to tell you about the type of research that I do in, in my laboratory. Um, and I work on a protein, a tiny protein called a myosin molecular motor. It truly is a molecular motor that can generate force and motion that's needed for the heart to be able to pump. And as Jonathan mentioned, there are genetic mutations in a lot of patients that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this tiny molecular motor that is 5,000 5, times smaller than the human hair has a genetic mutation in it. And you saw what the outcome is. And I'd like to tell you what that mutation does to these molecular motors. So <clears throat> uh, I think Jonathan did a great job introducing uh, the concept. You know, cardio, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, it's, it's a big word. Uh, we defined it, but you, you obviously know about it because you have heard, as Jonathan said, you'll hear stories about a young individual who might die on a soccer field or a basketball court, such as uh, Len Bias, um, I mean Hank Gathers uh, and Reggie Lewis, um, shown here. 
And uh, what happens is they die suddenly. There's an autopsy. They discover the person has an enlarged heart. They then may do the genetics on that person, and guess what? They discover that there's a genetic mutation in, that, for instance, that myosin molecular motor. Now, what's the prevalence of it? It's one in 500 individuals. So that means there are 1,250 Vermonters that have this genetic defect. As Jonathan said, they may be asymptomatic, meaning they don't know they have it. Um, but the thing that you hear about are these sudden cases. And it is the leading cause of death in young individuals other than accident, suicide, or dr drug overdose. So these pictures should look familiar. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is seen here on the left. Dilated cardiomyopathy is seen on the right with the normal in the middle. And the thing that's very obvious to you now you understand that hypertrophic means a thickened wall, as you can see here. This heart is also enlarged, but notice that the walls are very thin because it's dilated. Now, the interesting thing is that both of these clinical conditions, hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathies, are associated with mutations to this myosin molecular motor, but you get two different outcomes. Let me show you a picture of this myosin molecular motor. So this is an atomic level view of this motor. Now this motor is made out of 2,000 amino acids. Those are the building blocks of proteins. So this is a protein molecular motor. Those 2,000 amino acids are basically the nuts and bolts of this engine, of this motor. And I just told you that you can get a genetic mutation in this motor, and in fact, we may get a genetic mutation in one of the nuts or a bolt, just one out of the 2,000. And just by putting a mutation in one of those nuts and bolts, you, you wind up with either the hypertrophic or the dilated uh, cardiomyopathy. Okay, it's a little difficult to see, but you see these tiny purple circles here. They're, they're peppered throughout this myosin structure. Those lead to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Those are each one of those. A patient will have just one of them, not two or three or four, but just one. And here's a red one. There's another one here that leads to dilated. So me, as a researcher, always trying to understand what the structure and the function of proteins are, um, really benefit from Mother Nature's experiment here. She's identified which nuts and bolts are the critical ones because when they get mutated, it's a very serious outcome for the patient. But for me, if I have 2,000 of these nuts and bolts and try to figure out what each one does, it's much easier for me to look at what Mother Nature is pointing to. But she, has a, she doesn't want to release her secrets all the time because take a look at two cases. Here's a purple one. Here's a red one. They're virtually next to each other in the structure of this myosin molecular motor. One results in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The other results in the dilated. It's my job to try to figure out how the mutations alter the function of this motor to then give you these two clinical distinct uh, outcomes. So how do we do that? Well, we take advantage of the fact that I can get samples from human patients, or in fact, we can make mouse models that reflect the human condition. And what I'm gonna show you is our ability to look at the function of this molecular motor by studying two different mutations, one that results in the dilated and one that results in the hypertrophic <coughs> cardiomyopathy that are in the same structural region of the myosin molecule. So let me do a little, um, functional uh, definitions for you. So Dr. Flyer said the purpose of the heart is to pump, pump, and pump. But in order to pump, that heart has to generate power. Where does that power come from? That power comes from the individual molecular motors that generate 
the two critical aspects of power generation. You have to generate force and motion or velocity, and that's what determines power. So how does that power of this molecular motor give you the pumping capacity of that heart? Well, let's look at the anatomy a bit closer. And what you'll see is that the heart is made up of individual cardiac muscle cells. These are tiny cells. You can see one beating here. And each of these cells are then made up of a smaller contractile unit called the sarcomere. But notice that the sarcomere is made up of that protein myosin. So here's that tiny little molecular motor. And what does it do? It grabs onto this other protein called actin, which is basically a rope. And so when the heart is stimulated to contract and each cell contracts, these myosin motors pull on the rope, making the muscle cell, making the muscle cell itself shorten, making the cardiac, uh, the heart itself pump. Just to give you a sense of dimensions and sizes here, each one of these muscle cells has 150 million myosin motors in it, just one cell. So you can imagine how many motors are in your heart. And they all have to be pulling on that actin rope at the same time. So how does, um, how does this uh, relate to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, the view of the world at the time when I got into the field was that mutations to this myosin motor that's pulling on this actin rope, mutations usually don't make things better, they make things worse. And so the argument was that this mutation must affect the power generating capacity of each myosin motor, because that's where the mutation is, and that that gets reflected in the heart. And if it's not working too well, maybe you can't generate enough power, a way of compensating is for the heart to enlarge. And that enlargement then has repercussions. Okay, so that was the hypothesis. What I'm gonna show you is that in our lab, we can actually measure the power generating capacity of a single myosin molecule, single motor. One that's basically, I just told you, 5,000 times smaller than a human hair. So how do we do that? The beauty of it is you can take a sample a, a, from a patient or a muscle sample, or you can, uh, like I said, um, get a, a model system, like a mouse that has the exact same mutation, and then you can isolate, you can grind it up, grind up that heart tissue, throw everything away except two components. All you have to do is keep the myosin molecular motor, and you only have to keep the actin rope that myosin pulls on, and myosin, as a motor, says, I don't care where I am, if I see an actin filament, I uh, see an actin rope, I'm gonna grab it and pull it. So I can measure in a microscope the ability of these myosin molecular motors to move an actin filament. And here you see these actin filaments coursing over a, a, a bed of myosin molecules. Just to give you another sense, this actin filament is 10,000 times smaller than a human hair in diameter. Okay, so we have, we have cameras that can see this type of molecular motion. The good thing is we put little fluorescent probes on the actin and we use cameras that were developed for the military for night vision to be able to see these things in a microscope. Okay, we can measure velocity, but I said the ability to generate power means we also have to measure force. So how do I measure force in this system? It would be nice if I could just grab onto that actin filament that the myosin motors are tugging on and measure that force. So how do we do that? Are there any Trekkies in the audience? We will use a tractor beam. This, this is actually reality. Let me, let me define a tractor beam. Activate the tractor beam. A tractor beam is the common term for the focused linear gravitation force beam installed on most starships. In my world, if I take a laser and I focus it into a microscope, right at the focal point of that microscope, you create a force beam, a force potential well, that will hold on to particles in space. Well, if I can hold on to that particle, that I should be able to then attach it to an actin 
filament to an actin rope and then hold on to it when myosin's being able to pull. And in fact, that's what we do. So let me show you the, um, the system here. So let me get you oriented. Here is one laser beam trap. Here's another one. And we take tiny one micron, one hundredth the, the diameter of human hair, tiny little beads, which we put super glue on them. And then I'm going to attach a single actin rope. And you're going to notice what I'm going to do in this video. I'm going to attach it to the other bead. And then I'm going to pull on it. And then we're going to measure force. So here's the actual video of that happening. And if you're people that work in my lab, if they're really good in video games, they do well here. So here you go. These two beads are just sitting in solution. I just moved one to the left because if I move the laser, and now I'm trying to move the solution so I can attach the other end of the actin rope to the bead and watch, here it is, and now I'm gonna stretch it out like a violin string. What do we do with that actin now that I'm holding on to it? I bring it down to the surface that has a single myosin molecular motor on it. And I can measure the force that that myosin motor generates as it attaches to the actin and pulls on it. Each of those little impulses are force. How much force does a myosin molecular motor generate? It generates a piconewton of force. How much is a piconewton of force? Can I have a piece of paper? A. <laughs> You ready? The gravitational pull of my body on this piece of paper is one picanewton of force. So we can measure that. The interesting thing is these instruments are so sensitive that if a truck runs by the building, it's like a seismometer, we can sense that. So we have to have it in a special room that's uh, vibration free. So here is the cool thing. I can now measure the power generation of this myosin pulling on this actin. It's, it's just like I can measure the power in a motor, right? Like your car engine. And in fact, if you, if you allow me to digress for one second, I'm gonna tell you that in fact, the power generation is the same kind of um, parameters that you look at in a car engine. But I'm gonna tell you mother nature made a far better engine than any of the car manufacturers in this world can ever make. Here's a quick calculation. If you, if you calculate how many revolutions a car engine makes, assume a car goes 100,000 miles in its life, at 60 miles an hour, at 3,000 RPMs when you're traveling 60 miles an hour, that would be equivalent to 450 million revolutions of that engine. Now, let's think about a heart. Average age of a person might be 75 or whatever. Let's just go with that for now. At 70 beats per minute for the entire lifetime of that individual, that heart in that individual will beat at least 3 billion times. So Mother Nature has made a far better engine and motor than uh, any of the car makers. Now, see this curve? It's, it's a power curve. I can now go back to the laboratory and create a power curve for the myosins that have genetic mutations in them. And I'm gonna look at the two mutations, one that's associated with hypertrophic and one that's associated with dilated. And remember, the field at the time basically said, you mutate these motors, things go south quickly. Here's what we measure in the laboratory by looking at force generation at the level of a single myosin molecular motor. Here is that power curve. I showed you what in engines, you get these peak power curves that depend on RPMs and stuff like that. We can measure peak power curves. But the interesting thing is, yes, for the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, the mutation resulted in a reduction in power. For the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the field said it should also be a reduction in power, and look what happens. In fact, 
the motor generates far more power than normal. I can tell you this wasn't easy getting published <laughs> when, I first, when we first came up with this result. I can't tell you how many times we said, go back to the lab, it's got to be wrong. But in fact, it's right. So how does that play into our understanding of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and what are the kind of therapies that one might do? So what happens is you have to view the heart as this fine-tuned, balanced machine. And what happens is if you enhance the power generating capacity of the motors within that heart, you slide down this slippery slope and you end up with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The converse is if you reduce the power generating capacity, you fall down the slope in the other side and you result in dilated cardiomyopathy. So this heart is this fine balanced um, system. Now you may say, why would increased power generating capacity lead to this condition? In fact, the interesting thing is, if you look at this muscle, Dr. Flyer said that in fact it looks like there's disarray. If you look at the muscle, there's actually a lot of scarring in that tissue, in that muscle wall, there's a lot of scarring. The muscle cells are disarrayed. It's not, it doesn't look like good muscle, it looks like injured muscle. And in fact, the hypothesis that we propose is that this increased power generating capacity at the mo molecular level, at these single myosin molecular motors, it's like putting in a Ferrari, it's like taking a Ferrari engine and putting it into a Volkswagen chassis. Right? <laughs> so what happens is, take that to a track and it's not gonna be a very pleasant uh, scene. So what happens is, we believe that the heart is literally ripping itself apart internally and that's why you get the scar tissue and that increased mass is not good muscle, it's in fact diseased muscle. So, where's the future? I think uh, as uh, Dr. Flyer said, I think in Italy now, if you want to play any sport at the high school level, you have to have an EKG. That's one way of testing for this. Um, I'm going to predict that in the next 10 years, I may be wrong, um, that any child born at the University of Vermont Medical Center will have their entire genome done. If you do it yourself personally right now, it might be $3,000. I think in 10 years it'll probably be $100, $100. And then you will know whether you're predisposed to this condition or not. It brings up another issue in terms of ethics, and we can have that discussion, okay? So the interesting thing is based upon the observations that we made here at the University of Vermont, there are companies out there that are doing precision medicine. There are biotech companies that are making small molecule therapeutics that patients will take. They're in, they're in phase three trials now, whereby, for instance, in this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mutations that have overpowered motors, knowing that you have that mutation, why not take a, some medicine that basically powers down or puts a governor on that motor from birth? And guess what? In mouse models, that are predisposed to the hypertrophic condition, they give them this medicine at birth and they do not have a, a hypertrophied heart, so it works. You can do the contrary. For the dilated, where the, mo where the motor is underpowered, you can give it a med uh, some you know, therapeutic that would goose that engine and then hopefully be able to balance the power generating capacity. So I just wanna end on this one note which for me, um, being here at the University of Vermont, I think is, uh, gives me a lot of pride. It also gives me a lot of hope that we as basic scientists, when we do what we do on a daily basis, may have some impact sometime in the future. And it was interesting because I was asked to comment and write a perspective uh, in Science Magazine, this was just a few years ago, uh, when this study came out from this biotech company based out of San Francisco, it gets other issues. So, so, so remember,
terms of, of, of the treatment, it should be focused on the muscle and not, not the valves, what I'm hearing you say, because the valve is subject to the That's correct. impact of the muscle. That's correct. So valve replacement and so on really doesn't do all that much. Yeah, the focus here is not actually valve replacement or doing anything to the valve. Medicines can help either relax the pumping chamber or help with those upstream symptoms, okay? But the therapies like surgery and other things are focused all on the muscle. It's not a valve therapy or a valve treatment or a valve surgery. It's directed all at the muscle. I'm, I'm interested oh, yeah. in the, um, when you showed the movie of the little beads being manipulated, you, you were moving them on the order of maybe nanometers? How do you do that? <laughs> you're, you're manipulating them in three-dimensional space, and I, is it all focused laser traps? Uh, that's, a, that's exactly right. Um, so everything that you saw, as, as I tried to give uh, an example of the size scale that we're dealing with, um, we're, we're talking in the orders of five to 10,000 times smaller than a human hair. Just seeing a human hair is tough in, its, in and of itself. But the beauty of it is, uh, microscopy these days has gotten to uh, has gotten to the level where we can actually see those type of dimensions in the microscope. And once you do that, then you as a user are basically sitting looking at a TV screen, you know, playing your video games, and you're um, you're you're making manipulations that are at the um, sort of submolecular level. And we have that kind of capacity. I'm not licensed to work with lasers, so <laughs> I'll let David do it. If you carry the gene that you said could be inherited for this, do, is it possible that the gene would not be activated or triggered? You just carry it, but you don't really get the thickening? That's a great question. That question itself uh, gets to the heart of the problem, which is some folks may have a gene that is identified and associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but their heart may not enlarge. An example that I gave during my talk was a grandson, a father, and a grandfather, a grandmother actually. All three have the gene, have the most common gene. Only the grandson has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Everyone's been tested for the gene. Everyone's been looked at with a lot of heart testing. When you look at the hearts for the parents and grandparents, they have the gene, but their hearts are normal. And when you look at the grandson, he has the gene, but the heart is clearly abnormal. And this is what we need to know more about. Why in some cases and not in others? It's very difficult. So, so, so the potential, too, is that even though that gene is known to be uh, mutated, um, that one has to remember that that mutation sits within the context of the human being and the environment. So there could be modifiers that are, could be genetic modifiers or environmental modifiers that may make it the case where one person presents and another person doesn't. Now, I, I don't want to scare the world uh, thinking that if you have a, a gene that's associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that you will die suddenly. Some of the genes have a higher, uh, uh, higher probability of that occurring, even though it's, it's low in and of itself, and others don't. So uh, you may have a thickening of the heart, but you never get to a point where you get into heart failure. So. Are there any known things you can do if you have that gene to prevent it? Do you know, like, for, to prevent that from developing into it or to prevent yourself from dying from it? I'll let David go first. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> um, if you're identified to have the gene, let's take the parents or grandparents of my patient. There's no medicine that we give them to prevent something from happening. This is a very careful discussion about how often do you need to see a heart doctor to actually conduct surveillance to see if things are changing. But if you see that you have 
there's a very complex discussion about testing for genetics and for what you are looking. Uh, but let's suppose today I find out I have the gene, one of these genes for hypertrophic heart myopathy. There's nothing I can go and buy and take or do that says in 10 years I won't develop this. So it's a lot of careful discussion about do I even want to know? And if I know, then how often do I need to see a heart doctor to try to figure out are there changes happening slowly over time? We're not, we're not there yet to be able to say, if you have this, do that. So it's not something necessarily that diet and exercise could help no. with? That's correct, no, unfortunately. But you should maintain a great Mediterranean balanced diet and exercise <laughs> five days a week, 30 minutes a time. So, so just to follow up on that, let's, let's assume we're 100 years out in the future. You've probably heard of gene editing that's out there. It's called CRISPR-Cas9. Maybe at some point in time, if you know you have that, you can then edit the gene and take care of that. So but that's, that's not happening today. But it may. In fact, I believe it will. Any other questions? All right, oh, we have one. So if a child has that you, you know, a three-year-old or whatever, you, or, or a baby in utero, you, you find that. So you start medicating, or what, what do you do to you know, yeah. work with this So child? Rare, rare in utero, most often we'll see patients, these children before they're born to reassure the parents things look okay. And then we'll continue to see them at certain intervals of time to see how their hearts are developing after they're born. We'll ask, do the parents have any known genetic risk factors? If they haven't, we'll recommend testing to see if we actually can test a child for a known mutation. And we, again, to go back to the patient examples I gave, I can't say for sure, even if there is a genetic mutation, will this child develop? They might be, he or she might be more predisposed. There's probably a greater likelihood, okay? But at what point this is gonna happen, I don't know at nine or 15 or 21 or 35 or 45. It's a very careful family history and then very careful series of visits throughout your childhood and adolescence. And then a very careful conversation with the adult cardiology team um, as they transition from high school and beyond. There's no routine medicine that we start or therapies that we have. It's very careful, carefully guided observation. When, when someone is identified with a problem, why can't uh, the uh, thickened uh, ventricul ventricular wall be surgically uh, cut to make it thin again? It is when it passes a certain point that it's causing obstruction out of the ventricle and it meets certain criteria. So surgery is offered, but it's not prescribed for everybody. It's a certain subset that need it to relieve symptoms and very serious problems within the heart. So that is an option, and that is actually the gold standard of treatment right now. There's only a small subset of patients that actually develop that. All right, I wanna thank everybody for attending our lecture tonight, and we'll see you in the, on the first Tuesday of March for our next one. Pleasure. Thanks for coming.